systems, the main system that we use for HMGP is called Nemus. Uh, and Nemus requires a lot of uh, information uh, in order to get access to that. So I have been volun uh, I'll say voluntold, but I've been given the power of Grayskull, if you will, to be the conduit between our state and tribal partners and our headquarters security partners to make sure that we get all the forms filled out correctly. So uh, we're making sure we're giving the correct access to people who pass the security test, right? Uh, so with that, whenever you are requesting NEMIS access, there's four forms to fill out. And those forms can be a little bit tricky because they're geared toward federal employees and not our state and tribal partners. So when you're trying to fill that out, a lot of this doesn't make sense, right? So when I'm getting your information, um, I, I, I typically will send it back or call you and say, let's go over this. But Christy King and Carrie were gracious enough to give me a few moments this today to talk through this and just kind of go through these and answer any questions because uh, they are kind of confusing at times. The what I have pulled up here is called your non-disclosure agreement. Whether you, you're dealing with um, top secret security stuff or you're dealing with property addresses, all of that information could potentially at some point in time be um, uh, be personal identifiable information and compromise that can can cause bad things to happen. Um, we see all the time. I've got LifeLock and I've I kid you not, at least once a month, I get a uh, an email from LifeLock that says, you know, this uh, this store, this website, something has been hacked and all my information could possibly have been gone. I don't know if that's just their marketing ploy to get me to renew next year or if it's actually true. So I Googled some of this and it is actually true. So one of the things the federal government wants to do is to ensure that if if you are granted access to our national um, disaster database, our NEMA system, uh, that, that you understand that there's you can't disclose any information. So this form right here is the easy peasy form. It's basically your name, who you work for, uh, and just initial of these things. That's it. Uh, if you critical infrastructure information. So if you're working on a project that has a bridge on it, our bridges are called critical infrastructure. So when we're looking at this and you're thinking, does this really apply to me? The answer is yes. <laughs> so anything in here that you could potentially be touching in your career or in your current position uh, with your state or tribal uh, partner, any of this could apply at any point in time. So it doesn't have to necessarily be the project you're working on now, but it could be future projects in the future. Uh, sensitivity levels, all of this stuff right here. Any of this point in time, you could be having to deal with any of this stuff. It's better now to go ahead and check these get your approvals so that way if you do have a project that comes in that that has one of these classifications on it we don't have to stop work get your clearance again and go back so initial all of these here this is the easy peasy form basically don't share information uh, if you do uh, people will come by and knock on your door with suits and sunglasses and no personality okay uh, just read through this right here Sign date it. This is important here to have a witness. Someone witness your signature on it. And that's it on this one. I'm going to pause right quick and see if we have any questions on this non-disclosure form. Typically, I don't get any questions on this, but I want to pause and see. All right. This one right here. Okay, this one right here is the one we get a lot of questions on. It's it's actually the EQIP equip. I call it the Q-tip. Just it's easy to remember that that way. <laughs> this one right here is what we have a lot of uh, questions on because it's a gear towards a if you're becoming a federal employee, but they also utilize this for our state and tribal partners as well. I wanted to go through this one right here. All right. The purpose of this, if you're a if you're a new state or tribal partner, or if you've been there for a while and you just haven't used Nemus and you now need to use it, you're no longer you're not a new hire, even if you may be a new hire at that agency. For us, you're an other. 
And for the description, you're either going to put state or tribal NEMAS access. Easy peasy. Okay. This is what trips a lot of people up because they're, they're like, well, wait a minute. I, I just got started here, so I'm a new hire. But for this form, you're an other and state tribal NEMAS access. I hope everyone on this call, including me, can remember our name, date of birth, all of this information right here. Email addresses. Remember, this is going to the federal government. So the federal government's going to have these email addresses. I suggest only you putting your work email address in there and not your personal email address. There's no need for the federal government to have your personal email address. Put your work email address in there only. The uh, phone numbers, again, I would only put your work phone number in there. Unless you want the federal government poking around in your personal emails or your personal phone. Stick with your work emails. Uh, job title. What is your job title? Right. And again, this one right here where it says federal appointment type, uh, this trips people up as well. If you're a state or a tribal um, staff, the word other and put state tribal staff, whichever one you are, and the other. One of the important one is who do you report to, right? So we need your, your, uh, your supervisor's name on there. That's an important thing, mainly because there's any discrepancies. I'll get a phone call, and whoever you put on here will get a phone call. You will not get a phone call if you're filling this out. Your supervisor and me will get a phone call. So it's important to keep that one um, up to date. If your supervisor changes um, in the middle of your approval, just let me know. Just send an email up to me um, and say, hey, I filled this out. It was John. Uh, I got transferred over to Susie's group. My supervisor is now Susie. I can update it on my side. Your program uh, office region, for instance, um, in, in the state of Texas, uh, the state of Texas has got several, uh, they got their main office in Austin, but they call them regional offices throughout. So if you're in a, uh, a regional office, put that in there. I'm in mitigation region 246, whatever it is. And, and what area are you working in? Uh, in Texas, it may be Austin, it may be Lubbock, it may be Galveston. Uh, New Mexico, it could be multiple different places, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, wherever you're working at. This one right here, leave it blank. The reason we want you to leave this one blank is if you're only working one specific disaster, that's all you're going to have access to. As you know, we all work multiple disasters, so leave that one blank, please. This is kind of more of a repeat than other than than we had before. Um, if you're a state local affiliate, you click here. This also goes for tribes uh, as well. So if you're, I've been I've been voicing my um, <clears throat> change request to say state tribal affiliate, uh, but it, if you're a state or a tribal partner, click here. And then put in here state, uh, state agency, tribal, uh, tribal um, organization, whatever that is, and then the name of it. The one that the the last two that trip people up a lot are these bottom ones right here. It says FEMA POC. Who is that? That is me, the guy that's talking to you right now, Marty. You put my name in there, and then you put my name over here as well. I'm not only your sponsor; I'm your POC. Uh, and my duty station is Denton, Texas. So Marty Chester, Marty Chester, Denton, Texas. Done. Easy peasy. On the security clearances down here, the sensitivity. Anything on the left-hand side is uh, you're going to have to take polygraphs. You have people showing up with your at your house and your neighbor's house. It's just not a, a very pleasant experience. What we deal with, uh, with in HMA grants, specifically in HMGP, we deal on the left-hand side over here. So the it will be code number five. Again, I know I'm, I'm going through this rather quickly. If you get these forms, if you have any questions, reach out to me, please. Number five, and this is designated because of there's a few things that, that designate which one these are, one, five, or six. The amount of money 
that goes out in any in, in any FY cycle, right? So how much money could you potentially get in any FY cycle? And what does that information contain within your applications? For us in HMA, it contains a lot of PII information, right? We're going to get people's addresses. We could potentially get their uh, phone numbers, their email addresses. All of that stuff is is a high commodity on the in, on the black web, right, or the dark web, whatever they call that. So we want to make sure that we have the proper uh, security clearance here. So it'll be code number five. Nothing on this side, but the middle one on this side. And that's it for this form. All right, I'll pause right quick to do a check to see if anybody has any questions on this one. I don't see any questions, Marty. Good deal, good deal. All right, guys, moving right along. Um, here's another one, guys. Uh, in order to obtain that clearance that I just spoke about, well, we need to make sure that um, the the federal government, not us, but you know, I call them big brother, is going to pull your credit report. They're going to make sure they're going to pull your credit report, going to analyze your credit report uh, to make sure that uh, you, you don't have any outstanding, I call it bad juju, any out, outstanding bad things that can, can compromise your ability or your judgment to, to make a unfair or a, to make a fair, un, unbiased decision. So this form right here basically just says, hey, you're give it's kind of like when you get a loan somewhere, right? They got to pull your credit report. So this right here is just basically giving us um, the headquarters security authorization to pull your uh, pull your credit report. That's all it is. This is a soft, I ask, I said, is this a soft hit or a hard hit? This is a soft hit. They're just pulling it to double check. It's not a hard hit. You're not getting a loan or a mortgage or anything like that. So it's not going to impact your credit score, your FICA score anyway. So that's a requirement. That used to not be. That just started here recently. And this is a form. Most people have no problem with this at all, right? This is your standard form. Scroll down here, a bunch of words, a bunch of words, more words. Um, your date of birth, social security number, all of that stuff right here. If you're a male born after this date, you register selective service. If you've had any uh, military experience, put that in here. Uh, make sure that you answer these truthfully. Um, a yes doesn't automatically mean a denial. A yes means that, that you've, uh, you've acknowledged this and it may need to have an additional level of scrutiny. Number 13 right here should show up on your credit report. So that's why they pull your credit report to enter number, to verify number 13 as well. Um, the last one here is this right here. If you have any, uh, anything you want to explain about a yes, then this is where you can put that in there. Okay. And with this number 17, so a president gets um, appointed to the office. Most recently, President Biden uh, was elected, and he is in, in office. Prior to that, it was uh, Mr. Trump. Prior to that, it was Mr. Obama. Each one of those uh, has the authority to do uh, presidential appointments. So the Department of, of Education, their, their leader is going to change uh, pretty much every time the administration changes. Those are appointees. They get appointed. We, on the other hand, we have to apply for our jobs, do interviews, and hopefully get selected for it. So just think about that is we, when you fill this out, you're an applicant, not an appointee. Uh, and just continue on filling these out. There's nothing, uh, if you're not an appointee, which none of us are, don't fill out any of this. Stop at number 17 and you're done. That is my little spiel. If you guys have any questions, if you're filling these out and you're not sure the answer, please call me. Let's talk through it. I'd much rather spend two or three minutes talking through uh, the proper answers than to have to send stuff back and forth and it just delays your, your approval for this. All right, I will stop talking. Uh, any questions on any of these forms, guys? Okay, uh, the the process, once you send these to me, okay, 
I'm going to review them to make sure that all the, you know, the, the correct information is, is in there. I send these to uh, FEMA headquarters security. After I send them up, I get no visibility uh, on these. I'm either going to get something that says you're approved or you're rejected. Between the time I send these up and that comes down, uh, whoever sent these uh, will, will get an email from FEMA security. I, don't, I, get, I get no visibility on this. And there's going to be an attachment in there. It's going to be several attachments, uh, one of which is your fingerprints. You have to get your fingerprints done. Uh, and I, I, they used to send you cards. I think they still send you cards. And in there, they're going to give you a list of places to go. And they're all FEMA regional facilities, which you may not live close to a FEMA regional facility. Uh, if you're in Lubbock, Texas, which there's a, uh, a TEDM a regional office around that area, there's no FEMA webs or there's no FEMA uh, buildings there. You can schedule with your local police department for free uh, to go get your fingerprints done. You just have to call and schedule it. So when you get your uh, email from the security um, staff that are working your case, and you'll see this list, and it's like, oh man, the closest one is a is a three hour drive. Just pause. You can get it done at your local police department. You just got to call and schedule it out. All right, that is all from me. Barring any questions, Ms. King, Ms. Carey, I'll turn it back over to you guys. I see no questions. All right. So thanks again, everybody, for being here. Um, and thanks, Marty, for kind of giving that overview, because I know that as these disasters keep happening and and things change in terms of staffing at the state, um, you know, it's needing to get access to the NEMA system while it's still around is, is important so that we can kind of continue pushing things forward and getting money on the street where it needs to be. Um, so with that, the next part of this training in this discussion is going to be hands-on. There's no slideshow presentation or anything like that. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we're actually going to get into NEMIS and I'm going to enter an application. So one of our states has graciously provided an application that they are going to be submitting under a disaster. And we're going to kind of walk through the process of entering it and talk through some of the things that are best practices and tips and tricks and things to look for and things to look out for when entering an application into NEMIS. So I'm going to share my screen. Close that. Open NEMIS. And I did not have it open because NEMIS has a tendency to time out when you don't use it for five minutes. So it'll take just a second to reopen, then we're going to dive into an elevation project that's going to be submitted. And sometimes NEMIS is a little bit difficult to see when you share screens, so I'll go ahead and apologize. Um, if it's a little difficult to see, I'll make it as clear as I can, but it's you can't really adjust the size of the font and text in the system. So we're going to go ahead and dive in. So when you get into NEMAS, the first thing you have to do is go under mitigation. Y'all screens from the state side may look a little bit different than mine. Um, but you're going to be working under mitigation and you're going to end up opening the, dis the relevant disaster. So I had Nemus working pretty quickly earlier and now it's going to stall when I actually need it. <laughs> So Nemus can be a little bit of a booger sometimes. Here we go. Okay, 
So once you're in your disaster, we're going to be working under application development. So up at the top toolbar, you'll see file, disaster, projects, funding, plans, repository, admin, window, and help. We're going to go under projects, and then we're going to select application development. And while this is opening, I want to say some of the one of the tools that you have in the file share pod in the Adobe Connect room is the Nemus user manual. And if you don't have that, download a copy of that because everything we're talking about is laid out in that Nemus user guide. So you can go through and follow up with, with that manual as well to follow the same steps. So we're in Nemus, we're under application development. I'm going to go under new. And you're going to get this pop up and this pop up is basically confirming the disaster, the application number, and this is not the FEMA project number. This is just the application number. It's based on just when the application was entered into the system. Click OK. So we are at the point where we are going to start entering information. And any application you enter is going to start with who the recipient for this project is, which typically that's going to be your state or the tribe that is working on the application. So real quick, can everybody see OK? I know it may not be the best, but can you see what I'm doing? Yes. OK. All right. So on the first information, again, is going to be the recipient. So this is going to be your state or your tribe. And when this pop-up opens, you're going to hit more recipient info. And you're going to have another pop-up come up. And in this instance, because this disaster was set up using um, the state of Texas, because this is a state of Texas project. Thank you, Tito. Um, the recipient in this case is going to be the state of Texas, and the schmo is Mr. Josh Davies. So this information has already been put in the system when FEMA set up the disaster. So if you go in and start working on an application, and under recipient info, you need to change some of that data. You can change the contact information for that point of contact. But if you're going to change the state or any other information, you need to contact um, FEMA to work with you because we may have to make some changes on the disaster overview and setup side. But for now, this is the correct recipient. So I'm going to click OK. And then we're going to identify the appropriate subrecipient and make sure that that subrecipient is listed in our system. And if they're not, there are some other steps that we would have to go through in order to find that recipient. So I click search and I'm waiting for another pop up to come up. We are going to add. So in this instance, it's going to ask you when you're trying to find the subrecipient, it's going to ask you for either the county code or the public entity. So in this case, I am going to go with county code because in the application that was submitted I do have their information so once I am able to 
click into it. And I apologize for these gaps, everybody. It's just sometimes Nemus is just kind of slow to move forward. Okay, so I am going to look for in this list. My there we go. So I am looking for Aransas County. And then I am looking under the place name, the city of Aransas Pass. So I was able to locate them, so they're already in our system. So I'm gonna click okay. And so now you'll notice that by clicking that information, the Subrecipient has changed from statewide to Aransas Pass. So I'm going to click OK. And on the screen, so now I've identified the state of Texas. Aransas Pass is my subrecipient. And then I am going to see if there Mitigation plan has been put into here, and it has, so I'm going to click OK. So one thing I'm going to have to do with this one is whenever you're entering an application and there's plan information that is not included or it's expired, FEMA needs to know that so we can go into the plan repository and add information on the updated plan. So for now, for the purposes of this application and this exercise, we're going to go with what we have. Um, but as you are entering an application and when you go to look for the hazard mitigation plan, go with what's in the system and let us know that we need to update the plans repository because one of the things that we found is a lot of times when you click this enable manual entry of plan data it doesn't always save right so it's it's gotten to where with nemus it's a little bit easier for us to go into the plans repository and put those dates in and update it rather than trying to do the manual entry that honestly doesn't necessarily always work. So just kind of a, a tip there. And then you're going to look for the subrecipient application prepare. So we're going to look for prepare info. And this is going to be on the application itself. So you're going to look for your points of contact and get those entered. And we may actually see. And I don't see the points of contact on the information that I have. So what we're going to do is we're going to come back to this. So I'm going to click cancel. So once you enter the recipient and subrecipient information into the applicant information section, you're going to hit save. You want to hit save early and often because if you navigate between screens and you enter a bunch of information, Nemus is sometimes tricky and you can lose information. So you always wanna hit click, 
save after every time you complete a screen and enter information. So the next thing we're going to do is go to the problem and risk data tab. And I actually have a document that I need to save real quick. Let's go to desktop. So I'm going to attach the document that I just put into that I just saved. And I just, there it is. Okay, so I'm gonna need to close it. All right, so let me try clicking open again. So when you attach a document into Nemus, you're going to hit archive. And I know it sounds a little weird. Why are you hitting archive? But you're going to hit archive and then you'll be able to select the document that you want to upload from your computer. And you know you have a successful save when you get this, this pop up that says successful archive of document. If you don't see that, then your document hasn't been saved properly to the system. So I'm going to hit OK, and I'm going to hit close that, and then I'm going to hit Save. So now you'll see the document pop up in that window. So we've got our problem statement there, and typically on this screen, that's that problem statement is going to include like your alternatives and things like that because usually that's part of your scope of work. So you don't really have to attach it multiple times. So in this case, that document has the problem description, their decision making process, and then their risk and cost effectiveness information will be entered later. So we're done with this screen. Then we're going to go to project info. So I want to spend a couple minutes talking about some best tips and tricks on on this screen, because this is where we're going to look at the scope of work for the proposed project and start digging into what we're actually going to do for this project. So the title of this project is going to be the Arancis Pass. home elevation project project then I'm going to reopen that document that I just had open a minute ago because in Nemus hopefully it'll cooperate and let me cut and paste because this application did a really good job of of summarizing what the problem they're trying to solve is and that they're going to be elevating repetitively flooded structures. So we're going to copy. Hopefully it's going to cooperate and let me paste. And it looks like it's going to. So in the project description, what we are looking for is the same level of detail in the application that you would see, or the same level of detail in Nemus that you would see in the application. It's really easy for, to come into Nemus and know you have a paper application that has all these details, and just to say we're elevating two structures in Nemus. The problem there is that Nemus is our system of record. This is what FEMA uses as of right now to officially approve applications, to 
allocate and obligate the funding for a sub award. And this is where we go through the, the closeout process. So the, the same level of detail for the scope of work, the budget and the work schedule needs to be included in NEMIS as it is in the application. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're entering applications, because again, it's real easy just to kind of summarize an elevation project or an acquisition or a reconstruction, but we still want to see the level of details for even those projects. For drainage projects and your more complex projects, especially if they're, they're phased and you're going to be doing engineering and design on in one phase and then the construction on the other side, we need to know that in NEMIS as well. So again, just keep that in mind. And I am not sure this is going to let me do this. Let me try it here. Okay. So it let me paste part of what I was going to capture where it talks about, um, I know it's all here. So it talks about the, the issue that they're having and that they've had homes that have had water in, at the first floor living spaces and that homeowners were forced to evacuate in most, in some cases. And then in 2017, Hurricane Harvey caused extensive damage. So the level of detail is here is, is really good in terms of what they're going to, what the problem is. And then talking about the fact that they're going to be elevating to structures. They're going to be elevated to two feet above the 100 year floodplain. They're going to conform with the ASCE 24 and that um, they're still, they're going to work on um, determining for each structure what type of construction method is going to be best, but it's either going to be on open foundations or continuous foundation walls. So just the level of detail is what we're expecting here. So we're going to hit OK. There's my scope of work. Then you have to go in and enter information down into the bottom part of the project info tab. And this is again, mainly about the type of project that we're looking for. In this case, we're going to try and go down the list and find um, the type of project. So it's an elevation of private structures. So you want to make sure that the type of project is consistent here in NEMIS and consistent with the application being submitted because in all in some cases it's easy to say oh well there's elevation of private structures and you may have gone just one click too far and it may say coastal or you know just make sure that you're selecting the right project type so when you find the project type you're going to hit add And that pop up was basically saying because you're dealing with an individual mitigation measure, meaning an acquisition and reconstruction or like this project an elevation. Um, you've got to go into the property site inventory and enter information on each property participating. So we're going to walk through that as well. So once you have the project type identified, we're going to click on county code. And this is in Aransas County. So there's the county. We're going to click add congressional district. So this is U.S. congressional district. And it says that this is in Texas District 27. Then we're going to get into the community name. So we're looking for Aransas Pass. Okay. 
boundary rant says pass, and we're going to hit add, then the hazard type. So of course, with this, we know that the issue is flooding and the hazard being identified in the, or mitigated in the application is flooding. And then there's this sea level rise application. And one of the things that is being looked for now with HMA programs, and it's kind of a renewed emphasis is what kind of an impact or how is the project being proposed taking into account sea level rise? For instance, with an elevation, you may see something in the scope of work about how instead of going to two feet above base flood elevation, as is called for in the local floodplain management ordinance, you may see something in an application that says um, you're going up a third foot so the two feet of freeboard plus another foot because your community has been tracking um, instances of increased flood depths and things like that based on sea level rise or you're tracking it somehow so that you know that that two feet is not going to be quite adequate. You just haven't gone through the process of updating your floodplain management ordinance or, you know, walk through that process, you know, does does the application take into account sea level rise? There's not a requirement to, but we just want to see whether or not it's been taken into account. So in this case, the main issue is just they get too much rain, it comes fast, so they have basically a flash flooding problem and they've got homes that are damaged frequently. So I'm going to click no here because it didn't really address anything with sea level rise. And once I have completed all of those tabs, I'm going to jump over here to the right hand side where it says state legislative district, because we still have to enter this information as well. So in this instance, the state legislative district for this project is going to be Texas House District 43. And now that I've entered all of this information, I'm going to hit save. And it's going to tell me that my data has been saved. So I'm going to stop here and see if there's any questions. Okay. I see no questions. Um, okay. So one thing I will say is that under this project description attachment, you can reattach that same document that we attached earlier. I'll go ahead and do that. Um, but if you attach it once, it's going to be in the system. And it's going to tell me to close it again. So I'm going to hit OK. archive so you can attach it again but you've already attached the same document so it's not a hundred percent necessary this may just be kind of that extra oomph and extra step you could go through just to make sure everything's attached to the application and all the sections but it's already there in the main attachments so it's not a must in this instance Submit save one more time, and then we're going to go to work schedule. And when you get here, you're going to have to go down here and click new. And we're going to start working on a couple of the line items that they identified in their work schedule. And I'm not going to do all of them. I'm just going to do a couple of them um, just for the sake of time. So their first line item is EHP, A and E, H and H, permitting. The time frame is going to be 
let's see, three months. New. And this is going to be three months. This will be the last one that we do. And this is going to be three months. Okay, so I'm gonna hit save. So with the work schedule, what we're looking for here is that it's not just one lump sum thing that says project's gonna take 36 months to complete. We want it broken down into measurable, identifiable tasks that are depic depicting the level of effort required for the project. So in this case, they're going to have to pull permits because they're in the floodplain. We know they're going to have to have permits from the local floodplain manager because it's development in a floodplain. So the SHPO consultation that's going to have to be done because that's going to take time for the community to send this application to the Texas Historical Commission and have them say, yeah, you're good to go, or there's something about the architecture or age of the structure that may require some additional um, considerations when doing the elevation. Um, then they have the required analysis and design. This is when they're going to go actually look at each property and say, okay, this is how, this is the best process for elevating these particular structures. So it needs to be depictive of the level of effort for the project and manageable task, because not only is that going to help you as the state um, or your subrecipient say, okay, we're six months down the road and we were supposed to have completed all of the H and H and permitting and we were supposed to have finished the design and coming up with how we're going to elevate these structures and here it is we are three months from being able to complete that second task so that kind of translates into your quarterly report where they can submit a qpr to you as your the state to say hey we're three months behind because of this so the work schedule in your application, the work schedule here in NEMAS needs to be again depictive and that's going to help you make sure that your subrecipients and us as FEMA support you as our state partners and tribal partners um, stay on task with implementing these projects within the period of performance. So any questions about the work schedule and entering it into NEMAS? Okay, I see no so now we're going to look. All right, now we're going to look at the cost estimate. So it's the same kind of process. Um, there are a couple of ways that you can enter a cost estimate into the system. Um, you can work with a spreadsheet and try and import it into the system based on the item name, unit quantity, unit of measure, unit cost, and cost estimate headers that you see here, or you can enter it. I'm not going to lie and say that I don't, that importing is easy because for me, it hasn't always been easy. You as a state may find it easy in that, and if so, then please go that route, whatever makes it easy for you to, to work through. But in this case, it just hasn't always been easy for me to, um, to import a spreadsheet as my cost estimate. So I'm going to work on entering the line items for 
this project. So they have construction, unit of measure, we're going to go each unit quantity one. And for the unit cost, just to make this simple, three, seven, New the labor. Each. We're going to do And, okay, so I've entered the three main line items that just kind of summarize the cost for this project. Um, I will tell you that I would have some questions about a couple of things on this cost estimate, but the main point that I want to make here is just kind of showing the entry process and that when you enter your item name, what we're looking for is at minimum for a cost estimate materials labor and equipment for a project and it again the cost estimate needs to be depictive of the level of effort of the project for a drainage project you're going to have a much more detailed much more extensive cost estimate than you would for an acquisition or a reconstruction just because you have the cost for buying the structures, the cost for appraisals, the cost for elevations, the, the different thing, it's, it's just not gonna be as extensive as a complex drainage project. So when you're entering your application, you want to have um, it broken out into materials, labor, and equipment at the very least, and you don't wanna have a lump sum. So I've gone into NEMIS on projects in my career and when I go to approve it, I can't approve it because the line item is one, one item and it's a lump sum for the entire budget for that project. And I can't, it can't work that way. So um, you need to break out the budget and it's not enough just to say that, um, you have a broken out budget in the application. So you're going to summarize it in NEMAS just to make it easy. You can't do it that way. The budgets need to coincide. What's in the application should be in NEMAS. I'm going to re-enter this one real quick. Okay. All right, there we go. Um, so Again, it's a similar process for entering the work schedule. So now we're going to go down here because there's a question that needs to be answered when you're entering the cost estimate, and it's dependent on the project. And it's underneath this total project cost estimate, and it says, is the project part of the initiative? And when we talk about the initiative, we're talking about those 5% funds that are set aside for a disaster to spend on projects that may not be as easy to have a BCA run on them. So it might be a warning siren or even a generator where um, calculating a BCA under traditional means is not, a, you're not able to do it. That doesn't alleviate you from having to submit a cost-effective narrative or a BCA narrative that shows that you've done your due diligence and that the cost is within those industry standards. So you still have to submit something, but if it's not part of that initiative, then you're going to click no. And then you're going to hit save. And 
and then we're going to go under match sources. And you're going to get a pop up that talks about it not being able to be changed um, without deleting everything. And, or once you start entering stuff in this screen, you have to zero stuff out and follow the instructions on this prop, this pop up. So right now I'm going to close that. So for each disaster, typically the non-federal share is going to be 75%. And <coughs> Excuse me, and that's a default in Nemus. So when you click on the Match Sources tab, it's going to show you the 75% federal share, 25% non-federal share. For this disaster, it falls under that 90-10 cost share that was approved by President Biden based on the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And just quickly, what that said um, is that any disaster that was declared between January 1st of 2020 and December 31st of 2021 is eligible for a 90-10 cost share rather than 75-25. So in this instance, we have to change that default to 90%. So we've done that and then you have to click new in order to tell me um, who is going to be handling the non-federal cost share. So here it's going to be local. City pass. Cash. In this instance, um, I am going to put today and then this is and then here you can do cash since they're providing cash and then one each 46, 42. So if you have a community that's going to um, handle the cost share in multiple ways, so they may satisfy part of that cost share using um, in-kind services because they have the equipment where they could go in and if you're doing an acquisition, they may have the equipment to go in and do the demolition of a structure. Or with an elevation, they may have an in-house engineer who's going to do the design and engineering rather than having to hire a firm or contractor to come in and do that for them. So if that's the case, they can handle the, the non-federal share in both cash and in in-kind services with the appropriate documentation. So um, in that instance where they're handling it multiple ways, you would just hit new and continue adding information about how they're going to handle it. So in this case, you might put in-kind services for engineering and design. And then if it's based on a number of hours, you would put um, the number of hours here, then you would find the number of hours on this list, wherever that might be, and then your total. So in this case, I am going to delete that one. And it took away all of them, so let me do this real quick. Mm-hmm. 
and you're going to hit save. So any questions about entering the match sources? For cost effectiveness, again, it's a similar, similar kind of process here. Um, there's a question here that says, was sea level rise pursuant to this policy included in the development of the BCA for this project? The answer is no. And the reason is, is because this subrecipient decided they were going to use pre-calculated benefits. So I'm going to click pre-calculated benefits, save, ah. all right, so we will just enter 6420 for now. Then, oh wait, here we need to change this to 450. So we're going to enter the project cost, benefit of one, and hit save. Why? What? I guess they changed this because you didn't always have to fill all of this out. So we're going to put TDEM here. And we're going to put today's date because this is all going to get updated by TDEM later. Save. Okay. Now we can click pre-calculated benefits. We're going to do the 100 year floodplain elevation and we're going to hit save. And we're going to hit save. So and close. All right. So if they were using the a standard BCA for like a drainage project, you would have to have the BCA in front of you and you would have to be able to tell this section of NEMAS um, the module that was run and some other information. So in this instance, they use pre-calculated benefits. So you still have to have the amount of benefits and the project cost and all of this information. And then you can hit click pre-calculated benefits, and that's as simple as that for this particular data entry portion. So any questions on the BCA? I do not see any questions at this time. You guys are being really quiet. So just kind of talking through the next couple of sections in NEMAS. Um, for this particular elevation project, the application says that the homeowners are going to be responsible for maintaining the structures once it's elevated. And one of the attachments that's going to have to be provided for this project is the acknowledgement of conditions form, which basically says the homeowner is not only going to have to maintain the structure, but they're also going to have to maintain the insurance and they can enclose the elevated space. So there's nothing really to attach here because the application states that it's going to be on the homeowner. But for like a drainage project, you would want to have that maintenance agreement or something in the application that that states who's going to be responsible for maintaining the mitigated infrastructure or um, 
what have you with that application once the mitigation project has been completed. And you can attach it here using that attach function. In this case, again, I don't have that, but it would follow the same process as you've seen previously in attaching that document. Public notices, in this instance, they did meet with several homeowners. So we're gonna say um, they're not required to, but they did, so we're gonna say yes. And we're gonna put new, and then you would fill out the information on the date of that meeting and that information when you have it. In this case, I don't have that level of detail, so I'm going to click no and we're going to move it forward. Um, and then that will get filled in before the application is actually submitted to FEMA. And under the attachment section, you're going to see where it talks about the project description attachment that we added. So we know that it's there. Then you're going to go through the eligibility review, and this is basically stating from an applicant perspective, um, whether you're a state or a tribe, that you've gone through the application, um, you're an eligible applicant, you have a, a FEMA-approved state hazard mitigation plan, tribal mitigation plan, the project type is an eligible project type and that the project criteria for eligibility, meaning that it's an eligible project type, the work can be completed within the period of performance, the cost estimate and costs associated with the project is reasonable, it's necessary to implement the project, and it's allocable for that project, meaning that it, it goes to serve a direct function for that project and that it's cost effective. So once you're able to explain all of that information, you would sign off here from a state or tribal perspective. So the one thing I wanted to spend a little time on and talk through is the property site inventory. So this section, we sometimes do have to ask um, states and tribes and subrecipients to go back and add information um, through the course of implementing a project and adjusting an application and that kind of thing. So I'm going to enter one of the two projects. I'm going to go in here. And just let's see two point three.
All right, bear with me. Let me. Okay. Okay. So once you have entered the information, just the basic information for a property, there's a bunch of information you're going to have to fill out down here. So I want to spend a minute on this question because it says, is this property included as part of the final project? Here's the thing. Sometimes a subrecipient may have alternate properties or properties that aren't going to be pushed forward first. So you may have 12 properties, but you only want to mitigate six of those. We still want you to enter all 12 properties into the system. The six that are alternates that you don't want to be reviewed as of right now, in this question, you're going to hit no, indicating that it's not a primary property, it's an alternate. If that changes, when you do an amendment to an application, and we're going to talk about amendments for a little bit in a few minutes, but when you do an amendment to a project because you're ready to push forward alternates in your application, you're going to click amend and go through the process of amending your scope of work. So maybe instead of um, elevating six properties, you're going to elevate eight because you have enough money where you can elevate two additional properties. You're going to change that answer from no to yes. And that's going to show the system that <coughs> there's eight primaries and you still have the four additional alternates. We still want you to include the alternates in NEMAS. And be sure that when you enter them into the system, that you are answering yes or no to that question based on whether or not they're a primary property or an alternate property. So any questions or comments about that? All right, so we're gonna quickly complete this. So we're going to go Aransas County. Call bar. Yes. So there's several tabs up here that you'll have to walk through. Elevation, since this is an elevation. Then we're going to go to property info. So for this property, it was built in 1950. This is going to be but latitude and longitude. So I'm looking at an extremely large spreadsheet that has this information on it. So I'm trying to Again, five six. Five six. Okay. Um not yet. Yes. One. Six. 
So this is an owner-occupied principal residence. Structure type is single family. Foundation type is gonna be slab on grade. There's no basement. The base flood elevation here, it says eight feet. First floor elevation says eight feet. Wait, no, first floor elevation is gonna be six feet. It's being raised two feet above base flood elevation, damage category, it's less than 50% damaged. So we've entered as much information as we have, and I'm gonna go ahead and click save. Then we're gonna to move to flood zone information. This structure is in an AE zone. So I'm gonna find AE. Add and save. NFIP info. Marine flooding, floodplain. I don't know that yet. I don't have the full attachments for this one, so I'm not sure about the insurance policy just yet. Um, there is a firm. Yes, it was attached. And actually, I'm going to say no, a hard copy of the map will be provided because the map's not going to be attached here. It'll be part of the application, which is perfectly fine. Hazard type, let's say flood. Firm info. Once I have that information, it can be entered, but I don't have it right now. Um, and then... To property site funding. For this property, you're going to want to enter the total for that particular property. So however much it costs to um, elevate the structure and do everything that's associated with that elevation, you're going to enter here as well. So you got to enter the property site inventory and as much information as you can possibly enter into the system because again it's our system of record um, and it is tedious so if you have luck with importing a spreadsheet that's fantastic because it's going to save you a lot of time i never have luck any luck with that so you know i just enter enter it manually when I do data entry. Um, but the main thing that I wanted to point out here is that anytime you have a project with properties that are both going to be primary and alternates, you need to designate that if you have a subsequent amendment where you're changing the status of those properties, then you need to note that as well. Um, because you want to make sure that that final list of properties is a yes to that initial question on whether or not the property is included in the final project. So as you move through implementation, you just need to pay attention to your property site inventory when you enter them initially and when you enter information for an amendment. And the last tab we're going to talk about really quick is management cost. So for disasters declared after 2018 and the passing of, or I'm sorry, August of 2017, and based on the passing of the Disaster Recovery Reform Act, um, each project is eligible for 5% subrecipient management cost based on the total project cost. So that is eligible. So that would be entered here. And we do validate that. So just double check the math on that when you 
see an application that's requested subrecipient management cost. And then you go through the authorizations and that's where you as the state is going to put your information um, and fill out this information so that you can move that project forward to FEMA. So I'm not going to go any further because the state's not ready to submit this application. So I am going to stop here for now on initial project entry and see if there's anything anybody wants clarified, questions asked. Please don't hesitate. Okay, and I'm going to throw up the poll uh, questions. So while you're thinking of any other questions that you might have, um, if you could fill out our poll questions for us, we'd really appreciate it. So once you answer the poll questions, I do have one other um, block of information that I want to talk about in terms of um, handling amendments. So we are going to look at that because I want to point a couple things out to you. Okay, we do have a question. Um, can you go through the closeout amendment? I work in closeout so the application entry doesn't pertain to my section. Ooh, okay. So I I will do the best that I can. And um, I am not a closeout expert. So all I can say is that when you re when the state requests to close out and you have to modify the application in terms of aligning the budget with the actual expenditures or aligning the scope of work with the um, actual work that was done. So let's just say in the case of an elevation, you have an elevation that's going to cost a million dollars and you only ended up spending 800,000 of that. Then before you submit that closeout package or as part of that closeout package, you need to submit a request for a budget amendment to align um, the scope of work with the final number of properties that were actually elevated and you'll need to amend your budget to align with that 800,000 and get that approved by FEMA before it's closed out because that final SF-425 is going to have to reflect that final reconciliation of $800,000. So that needs to be done either at the same time you request closeout or prior to. We would rather you do it as you know your application is going to change. You should be submitting those amendment requests throughout the implementation process as those costs come back or as properties withdraw from an application or whatever happens. Um, so you should be submitting those all along. But in order to reconcile that final budget, it should align, you should submit that request when you go to close it out. So I hope that helps. And if you have something specific that you want to know, and you can come off mute and let me know. Okay, any more questions? Let's see what I'm saying. So and um, if you have any other questions, I can put you in touch with um, Kelly, I see you're on, or Marissa, or Michelle Miller-Green, who's part of our closeout team. So any of our closeout specialists, we can put you in touch with you. You have specific questions about the NEMAS process for that. So really quick. I want to share my screen again because I want to go back into NEMAS and show you guys a couple of things regarding the amendment process. So, oh shoot, I'm going to have to save this. Bear with me for just a second. Let me see. Close. Okay. 
So can you guys see my screen? Yes. Is it back up? Okay. So regarding amendments, so the process for amendments is actually quite similar to what you just saw in that you're going to go into an existing application and when you open it, I'm going to change disasters and we're going to go to 223. Um, when you go back into an application that's already been approved, you're going to see an amend button and you're going to click that and it's going to open up basically a copy of the application that was already approved. So when you're walking through that amendment process, that's your opportunity to update the scope of work, update the participation status for the properties and homeowners that are participating in one of those individual mitigation measures, and then update your work schedule, your budget, and your BCA if you happen to have a cost overrun that requires an updated benefit cost analysis. So it's an opportunity to kind of update your project to where you are right at that moment and where you're headed. And we always want to see, and it's required by the, four, the two CFR, that those amendments to either the scope of work or the budget um, should be submitted to FEMA prior to the additional work being implemented or any additional cost being expended. So you want to get those approved prior to moving forward with those changes in the application. Okay, one, one second. Um, Terrell, did you have your hand raised? Sure. No? Okay, thanks. All right. Um, so one of the things that I try and catch when I'm looking at a scope of work or budget amendment, and I would encourage you guys as state and tribal partners to look for as well, is when you're amending an application in NEMAS, you can go under that application development tab and you can write rewrite the scope of work or add notes to the scope of work detailing in NEMAS what's changed. And a lot of times I don't see that. I don't see in NEMAS the changes that are being requested in the letter from the state or tribe. So take that as an opportunity to add notes and add those comments and change and point out what's changed in the scope of work. If the initial scope of work was to elevate 20 structures or you were going to upsize 70 feet of 36 inch box culvert to 48 inch box culvert, but you only end up needing to upsize 50 feet or you only end up elevating 15 structures, put a note in there that tell, tells us what's changed and don't rely just on the letter that's submitted by the subrecipient or the letter that we get from you guys as the state or tribe that um, basically is a concurrence with the request from your subrecipients. So you want to go in and utilize NEMAS in the comment areas to address what's changed. And I'll show you an example of an application that we reviewed for a budget and scope amendment. So this was an elevation project. And in this project, or this may have been an acquisition, because I've got two I wanted to show. OK, so this is an acquisition. So the scope of work initially was this first sentence, the acquisition and demolition of three properties in the floodplain. So I'm going to make the same comment that I made a few minutes ago, where when you're entering a scope of work, even if it's an acquisition, give me some more details than just that one sentence, right? Tell me why you're acquiring them and kind of tell me the process you're going to use to complete that work. So we got a budget and scope of work amendment to 
withdraw three properties from this application. And when I looked at this application, I noticed that there were some additional inconsistencies with the participating properties. Because looking back at the original application, because instead of seeing the notes in here, I had to go back and pull an application that was submitted in, I want to say, 2016 or 17, maybe even 2000, which one is this, 42, 23. So yeah, I think this was late 2015, early 2016. And there are some inconsistencies in the properties that were included in the project. And it turned out there the way the application was originally approved, we approved the acquisition of some alternate elevation or some alternate acquisitions. So not all of the properties listed in the scope of work were going to be acquired, but they didn't answer that one question correctly. So when I reviewed it, I put a bunch of notes in here and I notated who they were from and when they were done so that when it came to close out and people like um, Marissa and Michelle and Kelly or whoever's working on closeouts look at this, they see these notes in here and they can say, oh, well, this may be an issue when it comes to closeout and we need to work with the, with the state on addressing these issues. So I will go in and utilize the comments section under the project description to make notes on what's changed with the application if I don't see them. So I would encourage you guys as a state, before you submit an amendment request to FEMA, that you go in and you point out what, what's changed with the application so that we can see it and that'll make it easier at closeout. And it's the same thing with the budget. You have an opportunity to kind of tell us how the budget's changed and why the budget has changed so much. Because I had an application not too long ago where the project cost um, went from, I want to say like $3.1 million down to two point something million dollars, or I think just under $2 million. So it was like a significant cost adjustment. So it led me to ask a lot of questions how the cost estimate was so overestimated at first and what's changed. So keep in mind, you can add notes on the budget changes as well. So I'm going to show one more. So this is another budget and scope of work modification that we reviewed. And this is another one where the scope of work in the letter from the subrecipient and in the letter from the state, we knew what was changing. But the scope of work was not updated in NEMIS from when it was originally put in NEMIS in 2009 for this particular project. So when I looked at it, based on that request, again, I went and added comments to the project description and noted the date and time that I did it and comments about that amendment in NEMIS. So again, when it came to close out, it was easier to get the project closed out and there weren't quite as many questions that needed to be answered um, on what changed and how things kind of progressed as far as the implementation of this project. So making use of the comments, ensuring that your scope of work in NEMIS is complete and answers all of those questions like, the who, what, when, why, and hows of your application is important. The budget being broken out sufficiently is important and not lump, not a lump sum. 
not general categories, but a broken out budget consistent with the budget that's submitted with an application is also important and the work schedule as well. And with that, that is the last thing that I wanted to show. So if anybody wants to discuss anything about amendments or have any questions, I don't mind taking the time. Um, we do have a comment in chat from Kelly. She said, yes, a closeout amendment is simply a final project amendment submission of project actuals that should be submitted before or at time of closeout packet submission to ensure that the final project cost or scope of work are act appropriately captured in the system of record, which is NEMAS. Um, that's a change in approved scope of work budget, etc. Yep, absolutely. I see no other questions. So with yeah, I'm available for questions if you guys have any. I appreciate y'all's time and I really hope this was helpful. And with that, I will give you guys back about 20 minutes of your time unless there are any more questions. And again, I thank you all.